Welcome to Global Connections on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about corruption, coups, and other side effects of the war, or the wars, as the case may be. Wars of attrition lead to national exhaustion. We're going to discuss that today. Our guest for the show is Rupmati Kandakar, a geopolitical analyst who joins us every week. Welcome to the show, Rupati. Aloha, Jay. Thank you for having me on your show. Always my pleasure. Well, what comes to mind when we think about Ukraine, when we think about so often that it's called a war of attrition, uh, and we think about the side effects of that war, the side effects on Ukraine, and the side effects on Russia, including corruption and kleptocracy on coup d'etat and other side effects. What are your thoughts? Yeah, Jay, all this, uh, uh, these side effects started coming up when we saw uh, uh, recently when Ukraine attacked Russia on Russian soil. So all these issues started coming in. And otherwise, it was uh, technically a one-sided war, like we uh, see it. And uh, Jay, we've always analyzed both sides of the coin very uh, neutrally, if you say so. We have never taken... Um, exhaustive stance. We've always uh, sorted out the right and wrong. And so this time also we are going to sort out and mention the side effects of each of these wars, the Ukraine-Russia conflict and the Israel-Hamas uh, uh, terror uh, attack which happened on Israel by Hamas. So all these two conflicts are the one which we'll focus on. German elections also. The Russia-friendly parties across the eastern German states like Brandenburg, Saxony, and Thuringia, pardon my pronunciation, please, uh, the pro-Russian alternative for Germany, which now brings uh, Putin to a dance because it is going to give him a strong cross uh, foothold in a broad range of the former East Germany, a, a region where it had dominated during the Cold War. And Jay, uh, Putin was a KGB spy in the 1980s in Dresden. Germany. So a biographer had once written about uh, Putin that he is a German in the Kremlin. So he has a very strong affinity for all things German. And he, uh, he associates himself with uh, German politics very closely. So this is a plus point for him after this Ukraine uh, entering into Kirks. Yes, he served, he served in East Germany. That was his, uh, his KGB days. And uh, that was where he he met people. That's where he learned about KGB, um, mm -hmm. and that's where he made trouble um, from Russia in East Germany. Well, <clears throat> lately we've seen um, knifings in Solingen in Germany. Mm -hmm. We've and that was uh, apparently ascribed um, to right wing groups. Then there have been uh, attacks and arson in France and all these riots and the like in, in Britain. Some people feel, uh, you might be among them, um, that uh, he's, he's responsible for this, that he has his spies going out, his agents going out into Western Europe and trying to disrupt things by these various uh, outrageous uh, crimes. The other point I want to make before you go on is that uh, if Putin was uh, stationed in East Germany and had friends in East Germany, um, and now this East German right-wing, ultra-right-wing group is coming alive and it is supporting him, you have to wonder whether he, was, he is likewise responsible for that. Of course, sir, you're right. Uh, absolutely right on it, as always. So, uh, so, Jay, this uh, Putin um, narrative that he set up is that NATO shares the blame for this war in Ukraine. And second is that this would have been peacefully resolved if the West had shown diplomacy. So he uh, shows himself to be a statesman, and that's how he proceeds. Because in the Kremlin, he's surrounded by power centers and oligarchs, like uh, you have also studied about it. Uh, Jay, when Ukraine uh, when came into Russia, that was a shattering point for him because right now uh, they're coming closer to uh, the center, isn't it? They have the audacity to attack Russian soil, so it shakes things up for Putin that he doesn't have sole 
authority and you know he doesn't he's not the invincible kind of um, czar that we know and so it shakes things up and Jay, one more coup that happened in 2023 was when the Wagner group a private military group uh, that came charging into Moscow and uh, uh, Yevgeny Prisgozin who was known as the chef for Putin was uh, was head of it and we know what he did with it. The plane crash happened during the Hamas-Israel conflict hitting headlines. That was Wagner uh, group just disappeared. So he, he deals with people with an iron sword, but he has to be wary because the oligarchs and the power centers that surround him, as I mentioned, they also are waiting for an opportunity where he takes a mistake. He makes a mistake or he, he, if there's any slippage because for any dictator, any slippage comes with a retaliation, which is with the same, uh, what do you say, um, force that his authority is. So it may be as quick as poisoning, or it may be as quick as assassination, or it may be as quick as a coup. So uh, the options are many and uh, uh, plenty for the opposite side. And Jay, when um, we know one thing, that for the past 20 years, Putin has been investing very heavily on preventing this kind of a coup or preventing any kind of in, 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 incursion towards him. So he has invested a lot of amount in the security forces and the internal forces, which are very strong. And that was why the Wagner group could not proceed. So that's a, a thing that we have to understand that he has always taken this into consideration. He has always kept this front very guarded. And uh, Jay, uh, his elimination has to be quick and retaliatory in style. Uh, and that is what awaits him if he continues in this kind of, uh, you know, if the dissent continues, because voices are very few in dictatorship. But when it finishes or it, when it's on the decline, they rise. We have seen many great dictators come down. So this may be no exception. Well, let's talk about Kursk, um, the incursion, the Ukrainian incursion. Um, they had to think of all kinds of implications before they did that because, you know, the fact is that the Ukrainians are careful um, and they're very planning-oriented and timing-oriented, and they had their reasons for doing the incursion. But the incursion is a great insult. I mean, they rolled yeah. over the border like there was no border. Um, there was no defense, significant defenses there by Russia. Um, nothing really, and and they took a lot of hundreds of prisoners, and they rolled across this area, and they're still rolling, um, and some humiliation for Putin, and people know about it because the people who lived in the incursion area are leaving, um, and they're also talking to their friends and relatives elsewhere, uh, trying to find uh, accommodations while this takes place. This invasion by Ukraine takes place. So you know, what you have is a um, is a, a humiliating experience for Putin. And of course, he's trying to get back at them by redoubling his efforts in the Donbass toward Kharkiv. But, but the reality is uh, he seems to have been grossly embarrassed by this. My question to you is, does this bring us closer to a coup? Yeah, Jay, uh, because this incursion was something which uh, hurt the ego more than uh, the military uh, basis. And uh, that is where voices of dissent get more power from. They suck the energy from that uh, zone itself. And the Ukrainian uh, uh, attack uh, itself was had non-combatant goals, like we have discussed in our earlier programs. It was advertising to the world that Ukraine can go into Russia if given the right amount of aid and if backed well. So, and uh, Jay, one more other reason why this incursion was because they cannot use long range missiles. So they want to get as closer to the target of Moscow so that they can use the short range missile, which they're permitted to do. So uh, now if somebody's coming into your doorstep and into your house, that becomes a kind of, the head of the house is blamed for it, right? So this is the way Putin has come, come to the center. And when he is not able to move them out, even after weeks, that becomes a worse uh, stamp on him. So he is incompetent in uh, removing the, uh, or, you know, reversing the Ukrainian incursion. 
So why, if Ukrainian forces were so weak, he could have uh, removed them in a matter of minutes, but he's not. So is there a long-term plan on it? Is there a plan to engulf the Ukrainian soldiers and then take them inside? Is there a plan to strengthen the other places? These, all these war-related war questions keep on coming in. And Ukraine has a target set besides the non-combatant goals. Uh, they are just attacking the um, Russian oil uh, airfields and the uh, gas uh, infrastructure. So they have a very limited target to this incursion. Jay. They are not going to storm Moscow, but they're trying to get as close to Moscow as possible. And they're trying to show that they can get into Russia if supported well. So that is the whole uh, system, Jay. Yeah, well, it's settling down. The system is settling down. You know, at first, the U.S. put all, all kinds of sanctions on Putin and Russia and the oligarchs, and that had a certain amount of effect on, it, on the economy and maybe on the morale of the oligarchs, which is of concern. But now it, it, we, we begin to see the, the, the outline emerging. The outline is his, his military industrial establishment doesn't work very well. Uh, his recruiting efforts don't work very well. Um, he he pays a, a, a an enlistment bonus of twenty thousand dollars per capita, and he takes people out of prison. And the people who come to the front lines are not motivated to fight Ukrainians. A lot of them just give up, or they run away. In terms of the war, and in terms of um, recreating the military industrial establishment to fight the war. He's not doing that well. But what he's good at is he's an oil salesman. He goes everywhere selling oil, oil for weapons manufactured by someone else. So he's um, he met with Modi, as we discussed last week, but, um, and he, he sold some oil to Modi, and he got some weapons from Modi, I think, or um, money that he could you know, used to buy weapons, doing the same thing right now in Mongolia, Rupmani. He visited Mongolia in violation of the ICC's arrest warrant. He just snubbed his, you know, stumbled his nose at that. Um, and he's selling oil to Mongolia, and they are paying him for it. Probably cheap prices, but it's, it's ruples anyway. And so this is happening in a number of places, and he's becoming the world oil and gas salesman at, at some risk to himself if he gets uh, arrested. Um, and I think uh, we're going to see more of that. So his military industrial establishment isn't working that well. His military strategy really not working that well. Um, but he is able to sidestep uh, the sanctions by selling gas and oil. Therefore, um, if the Ukrainians can take down some of his oil infrastructure, that's really important. And likewise, if the Ukrainians can take down uh, some of his um, you know, infrastructure allowing the delivery of munitions uh, to the uh, Russian forces at the border, uh, that's very useful. So they have a real strategy going on, and they understand what I've been talking about, namely Putin's talent in selling oil for munitions. Yes, Jay. Yes, it's really, like you said, the cycle that Putin has created for himself is very lucrative for him. And that's the way he's uh, bypassing all the sanctions. And uh, Jay, what is it, it is in his favor is that oil and gas is such an essential commodity for Western Europe, for India, for China, for anybody, because uh, Siberia is still not tapped completely to its potential for oil. So he is a uh, the biggest oligarch that you can find on the planet Earth. And uh, like uh, Karl Marx has said, economics, uh, economy is the super uh, structure on which politics, government, everything is based. So he follows this model to the T and he makes his superstructure very strong. His base is economics. Yeah, uh, though he is a military spy, his base is economics. And that's how he, uh, corruption, J is a small word for him. He is the richest man on the earth. <laughs> so uh, we, we we cannot talk any uh, less of uh, his, uh, his uh, what do you say, conquests in uh, money. Uh, he has it all. So, uh, and Jay, it's such a, what do you say, self-sustaining cycle that he's created. 
about oil for gas to munitions that he uh, has set up, that it is, you can't really, uh, Ukraine merely has dialogue to ask the countries to stop using gas and oil. What is the alternative? If you provide an alternative to the countries and say, okay, we provide you with this oil, or we provide you oil from Venezuela, and you stop taking oil from Russia, that is a different thing. You know, there's an oil pipeline, just as the uh, there's an oil pipeline in the North Sea um, that services. There were two of them, but, but uh, some some Ukrainian blew up one of them. Um, mm. And uh, there's another oil pipeline that goes in the south of through I guess the Balkans, and I think it goes to Romania and Hungary, and maybe further west. And of course, Ukraine knows about this. Ukraine could cut it off this afternoon, but Ukraine hasn't done that. And there are strategical reasons why. Ukraine does not want to lose the attention and the, uh, you know, uh, the help that might that, that it otherwise has from Western Europe. And if it cuts off that the Balkan pipeline, uh, it, it will jeopardize the, its relationships in that area. But it may decide otherwise later. Fact is that Putin is selling oil everywhere, and uh, that that really helps him out. I, I think you know KGB is about information. It's about hybrid war. It's about spying and secrecy, and that's where his head is at. And he's involved in all these sinister moves, but not necessarily involved in military strategy or in manufacture of weapons. So we see his strengths and his weaknesses unfold as the war goes on. And I agree with you, oil is a big part of it. Hmm. Oil is a very big part of it. And take the flip side of it, Jay. Uh, if you take the flip side of it and talk about Zelensky in a darker mode, uh, Zelensky is now heading a bureaucracy in Ukraine. And that bureaucracy, that, that uh, uh, administrative setup in the government has got access to billions and billions of dollars. It's around $82 billion that have come in as aid, not repayable, not to be given back, just taken. So there are, there are, there are obviously going to be chunks of uh, corruption and uh, leakages in this uh, you know, transfer of money. Uh, and Jay, as we know, uh, Zelensky uh, himself, leave aside, but his setup, is the one which will now go for the money, right? Because they're in a desperate war situation. Finding uh, the uh, corrupt uh, channels in this kind of a situation is very difficult for any country. And uh, Jay, uh, the military assistance that from the US alone is around $55.4 billion. And on uh, July 24th, another uh, $46 billion aid was um, transferred to uh, Ukraine. So it goes on, this amount is not, uh, what do you say, uh, it's not even in our vision. And uh, Jay, one more thing is that uh, the UK has pledged around $12.5 billion and another $11 billion coming from Germany. And the G7 have given an assurance that they will give $50 billion as interest on the frozen Russian assets. So as you see, the finality of the economic resources available to Zelensky are very, very less. So, uh, you know, he has got tons of money at his disposal. Can he transfer them into military action is the goal. And But of course, there are going to be leaks and corruption in the entire uh, process. I'm not sure all the money you talked about has actually been moved to Ukraine. Uh, some of that is aspirational or promises that are questionable. Um, second point I want to make is that um, Zelensky was a, a television actor, a comedian, if you will, before he got into politics. And um, oh. what was his show about? His uh, his show on television was about corruption. Uh, no way. And he made he made fun of it, and it was it was the message, of course, was we have corruption in Ukraine. Um, um, and we are going to make fun of it and try to stop it. And that goes way back. By the way, uh, Ukraine was essentially a part of Russia back until 1991. It was, it was made independent in, I guess, Glasnost. 
And um, Russia has been a corrupt country from the time of the czars. I mean, it's deeply ingrained in the Russian culture, government system, ruling class, oligarchs, and the like. It is generally known as a kleptocracy. And I guess some of that must have rubbed off, especially in the east of Ukraine, uh, where you know they, they carried some of that culture with them. On the other hand, uh, Zelensky's main point about all of that is he's going to stop it. Um, and he has created a number of governmental structures. He has removed anyone he suspects of uh, kleptocracy, of corruption from, from government, from the military. Uh, he has prosecuted a number of them for taking hmm. bribes. Um, and he has actually made some significant progress. Uh, a Transparency International had an article about him uh, indicating that it was really admirable how much progress he's made in, in, on, on the transparency scale. And one of the things that uh, Zelensky has done is he's made all government contracts transparent. So if you want to know who's getting what, from the money that's coming in, you can go online. You can see what companies and who owns them are receiving what sums for what purposes. I wish we had that in, in this country. Um, and so he's really making significant efforts. He was always uh, interested in the subject and he is interested in the subject now. And I, I think uh, compared with Russia, uh, he is in much better shape on the issue of corruption in Ukraine. For sure, Jay. For sure, he's in that state of uh, mind right now. But for him, corruption is going to be uh, rampant because, see, as the head of uh, any state, to control so much, with so much of money going in. And uh, we've seen so many complaints coming in from the line of defense, like we discussed in our last program. There is not much of it. The soldiers are the line of defense, first line of defense. It has to be mines, air support, and then the soldiers which is not happening on ground reality. Uh, reality. And we saw uh, so many at the beginning of the Ukraine war, you had uh, citizens and you had musicians uh, take flights and go back to defend the country. There is a certain kind of exhaustion and wear and tear that comes uh, amongst the ranks because they're facing a bigger force. They're facing uh, and always supply to the lines of defense have to be top level. So that is kind of falling short somewhere, Jay. I hadn't heard that, but but what I did hear is that um, there were no mm, defensive, uh, you know, protections for Russia um, on the incursion area. But not too long ago, uh, mm -hmm. the Russian government allocated nineteen million dollars to build those defenses. You know, like. And tank traps and barbed wire and these concrete yeah, pyramids. Yeah. They they were given nineteen million dollars in order to defend that area of Russia, and none of it, zero, was spent. It was all pocketed. So this is a kind of you know problem you have. The other thought I have from what you said is that in this uh, really interesting Times Radio, that's a British uh, a British media company. Mm -hmm which I listened to once in a while, it's really very informative. Um, they talked about why the Ukrainian military had, had, had better strategies and better morale to the extent they can. Uh, it's because they go to other countries in Western Europe and in the US for training. Uh, and I, I, I guess you don't mean that when you say they wasted money um, by going to other places. Because the fact is that they are much better trained and their strategies, um, their military understanding of war is much better than the Russians. In the case of Russia, they pay this $20,000 bonus, these people who have no money, who are in debt, uh, and then they recruit them. And uh, they have you know, thousands of these young kids who have just paid off their debt, uh, who have some money in the bank because of this bonus. Uh, who go into the war. And and the reality is when they go in, they're completely unmotivated to fight with Ukrainians and they run away. They're ineffective. Same thing with um, the, the recruits from the jails, the, the, the prisoners, the criminals that, that 
Putin gets or, or the mercenaries that he hires elsewhere. These people are not committed. On the other hand, um, the Ukrainians, they're defending their homeland, their families, um, and they are uh, they need to be trained, and they are trained, and they're better trained. Although they lost an F-16 a few days ago, fact is that um, they are able to train on that aircraft, which is very complex, which usually takes years for training. Like, um, But they're, they were able to train on that aircraft in a matter of weeks. So you got to give them credit for the training, which is always outside of Ukraine. Uh, asymmetrical models of warfare, Jay, at its best, these uh, these points uh, that you say, you know, they're facing such a uh, well-equipped and larger army. The point, besides all the uh, precision, is the larger army. And uh, human trafficking, like you said, they're paying people to come in and giving citizenship. Ukraine and Russia both are giving citizenship if you come and fight on their lines. And Jay, when uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll move from, like, corruption is rampant, corruption is extravagant, and corruption will never cease in any part, in any office or any war field. So it will continue forever. That way, that's a, uh, what do you say, that's the glue that binds the bureaucracy. Uh, uh, what happened with the Ukrainian incursion was that, Jay, the domestic population was evacuated from the, those areas instead of fighting the Ukrainian forces. Now, why this was done? to create a kind of fear in the domestic population that Russia is coming to, this Russia will protect you and let's go to a better place and Russia is at war to create that panic mode. When you create, any country creates that panic mode, there is a domestic, uh, what do you say, support for uh, Putin's policies. That was the aim behind uh, these mass evacuations and uh, bringing them uh, to safety, right? So, uh, Jay, this domestic unrest is another feature which is one of the side effects of war. And uh, it keeps on flashing everywhere. And we see it one where uh, the terror attack happened on Israel and hostages were taken. Today, the same hostage situation is bringing domestic unrest in, in that country. And that is hurting the leadership. So that is one, one other zone that we can talk about, Jay. So let's go there. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, you know, I've I've been uh, watching and including articles uh, of about what's happening in Israel with people protesting in Tel Aviv, um, and uh, on our daily advisory, and it troubles me actually that this is sort of like the protests that were happening before October seventh, uh, that people in Israel they they play out their um, this disillusionment with uh, Netanyahu by going out in the street, mm -hmm. and um, they were they were protesting by the thousands before, and now again they're protesting now. But I I don't really fully understand, you know, uh, and you can agree with me or not. Um, but uh, what about the hostages? They say we're protesting against Netanyahu because he hasn't gotten the hostages back for us. Well, what do they expect Netanyahu to do? Um, okay. he, could, he could give up the whole thing. He could accept Hamas's demands. He could uh, allow Hamas to continue to occupy Gaza. He could uh, uh, let all the uh, let hundreds and hundreds of Hamas prisoners out from the Israeli jails so they could go back and do October 7th again. What do they expect him to do? And they're they're protesting because he hasn't found a way to get the hostages out. Um, so I'm I'm really not sure. Now, to me, if the if the Palestinians and Hamas wanted to have the peace they say they care about, they would simply give the, the, the hostages back. And that would be the end of it. And everything would be fine. Or at least they'd be a lot closer to a negotiated settlement. But they don't do that. And the hostages are still there. It seems like such an, you know, a, a simple solution, or at least a way to, uh, a, a major way to a simple solution, that they just don't want to do that. They want to hold on to the hostages, and as we have seen, they want to they want to murder them in the tunnels. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I'm confused. I'm confused as to exactly why all these people are out there in the street in Tel Aviv and elsewhere in the world. We're having a program about this tomorrow.
um, uh, protesting and criticizing Netanyahu. And, you know, it's, let me add that I think that for all of the countries we're talking about here today, all of them, um, civic unrest, civil unrest is not a good thing. And it is a consequence of these wars because people just get really unhappy, exhausted by the, the, the toll of war and they, they protest and they're, you know, they're expressing their resentment, not necessarily at the issue they describe in their protest signs, but at the war in general. The fact that their economy has suffered. Remember, too, Israel is having a general strike now. This is after all this time where their economy has been damaged. And I can understand why Putin doesn't want to have any protests, because his economy has been damaged, too, profoundly. And so the question is whether in a, an autocracy where you can stop protests, as he has, um, or in a democracy in Israel where you can have where people can protest, the First Amendment is alive and well in Tel Aviv. Um, you know, what's the better system in order to preserve the power of the government? I agree with you 100 percent. I agree with your analysis 100 uh, percent. This kind of domestic unrest that happens, Jay, it's for uh, the family sentiments towards their their uh, good, uh, you know, loved ones. Agreed. But see the pressure that Netanyahu is being put through by this domestic unrest. They want him to conduct free elections at this time. They want him to uh, uh, bring up the economy at this time. If, like you made such a valid point, if it was an autocracy, in a matter of moments, everything would have been out. Because it's a democracy, he has to sustain this kind of uh, you know, opposition and he is trying his best on all fronts. It's such a, a thin line to tread on, Jay. He has to balance the hostage uh, um, negotiations. He has to balance the war front. He has to balance the aid uh, which comes in. All these uh, supply, demand, and keep the economy running and keep the people safe. It's a handful of things that he has got on. And neighbors who are firing missiles on him, day in, day out, minute by minute, second by second. It does not stop. So uh, I feel the uh, sense of ungratefulness uh, that the citizens have for him should not be there. You have to be behind the leadership in any kind of war front, be it Ukraine, be it Russia, or be it uh, Israel, or be it any any place. You have to be behind how, how the Hamas terrorists are supporting the Hamas leadership. That's why they can target there is so much of disintegration in the ranks over here. So we have a problem. So we stand weak. If there is a, uh, what do you say, there is a strong bond to fight, unity in fighting, then there will be some action, no, Jay? If you're going to make Netanyahu weak, a day in and out, another person, successor will come in. He will not have the experience of what Netanyahu has at the moment. You change him 100%. When the situation becomes normal. But right now, the experience and the hold that Netanyahu has on his uh, uh, hand is um, un, what do you say, undispu indisputable, and nothing can compare to it right now. He is the top mm. position to fight this battle right now. Yeah. Well, I'm reminded of Putin and uh, the uh, Russian um, occupation of uh, Afghanistan, you recall? And he had Russian troops in there for a long time. Um, but people back at home uh, were complaining about it. I don't know if there were protests as, as there should have been. Um, but ultimately, the, the, the public opinion that was expressed on the point caused him to withdraw his troops from Afghanistan. We come to a point where we look at these side effects you're talking about. And we look at the possibility of a coup, although that's possible. I'm not sure that uh, you know Putin will allow that to happen. I'm not sure that he's um, weak to the point where it could happen. Um, we look at the uh, economic effects, certainly long-term effects on the economy, long-term effects on Russia, long-term effects certainly on Ukraine, the damage to their infrastructure, their cities, their institutions uh, has been profound. 
Um, it will take them years to recover, and that assumes that somebody will help them recover, which is not at all not at all clear, and and so forth. Um, so the, that's another side effect. It's the economics uh, of not only conducting a war, the war, but also of recovering from the war, rebuilding after the war. It may yes. take decades to do that. Post. Uh, war reconstruction is the biggest challenge for any nation, Jay. To bring back to lost glory will really take... They're literally being bombed into Stone Age right now, all the places that we talk about. Development has uh, reversed in so many areas. There is humanitarian assistance going on. They just come up to survival uh, points. There is displacement of populations. There is loss of homes. There's lots of family. Bring it all on, you know. There is... Every issue falls short of what is happening right now. And Jay, all this under uh, the constant search that the wars continue. There's a side effect that these wars are not stopping and they keep on continuing because the leadership is sustaining it in all directions. See, Netanyahu can't stop his war because if he stops, it's existential. He finishes. Uh, uh, Ukraine cannot stop. That becomes over. He will be... Uh, engulfed by the Siberian uh, bear. So, you know, you have these kind of situations where it's a do-or-die situation that they face. Also have the side effects, the, the not too obvious side effects, the fact, and you and I have talked about this, um, about, um, you know, the way in which war is conducted. If you see it happening on one side of the world, then it's more likely to happen on the other side of the world. A couple of years ago, um, destroying cities with drones was really not known. Now it is, for sure. And in the next war, there will be another one, I'm sure, um, it, there will be drones, guarantee. Um, different different views will emerge about hybrid wars. You know, Putin has, has sort of invented new kinds of hybrid wars where he causes proxies, as Iran has, uh, to go out into other countries and do destruction, uh, where he yes. uses disinformation and misinformation through social media. We have seen, and he has learned how to do that. So he's he's become a master, and we all know it, of hybrid wars in every which way. And that is a, is a side effect of wars. Um, the propaganda that's going on in the Middle East against Israel, that's um, that's that's it never it never was like this before. And so the result I suggest to you, Rupmati, is that these side effects, which are less obvious than the kinetic ones. Um, these side effects will come back to haunt us. This is the way it will be going forward. Don't you agree? Uh, yeah, Jay. The side effects are going to <laughs> really uh, come back. And, but the biggest effect that will happen on both these conflicts is the result of the U.S. election. Don't you agree, Jay? What is going to happen? The biggest, biggest effect which will cause different, different uh, counter effects is the U result of the U.S. election, and we pray that you know it comes to a good conclusion. Because Jay, what is happening in these two areas of the world is so dependent on U.S. politics that it is not even uh, uh, you know you cannot even measure it. And if there is wrong leadership, believe me, two countries are going to suffer very very badly. So we have to have something which supports the right. And Jay, it's like a fairy tale. <laughs> Good over evil has to prevail. And it's very necessary. And it is running out of time because human lives are being lost. So uh, time factor also comes into uh, um, uh, play because this is really, really necessary for all leaders to take a uh, point of Because right now, if you see, one another side effect is that all the leaders have become selfish right around. Everybody's got national priorities. They don't think in um, in terms of uh, ending the war. They're all thinking how they can milk out of this war, how they can get cheaper trade, how they can get cheaper, uh, uh, you know, how they can bypass uh, dollars. De-dollarization is a big side effect of this uh, two conflicts uh, in many, many areas. Well, the, the other thing uh, that comes out of what you just said is this, is that in the fog of war, especially the wars going on now, there is a, a moral confusion, uh, a, a lack of clarity, a lack of moral clarity. And when, um, you know, 
Trump gets up and defends Putin or um, Putin gets up and tells his people that this is a just war. He's this invasion is a just war. What you get is a confusion of the way the public thinks. Uh, mm. It's no longer clear. It's no longer right and wrong. There are lies insinuated, you know, into the the public conversation. And I think this is really, when you think about it, it's horrible. Uh, World mm. War II was very clear. We knew what we had to do and we did it. And every everybody understood that, both uh, overseas and in the country. But, but now it's pretty amorphous. And I think we have uh, lost our way. When I say we, I mean all of humanity. We've lost our way on what really counts here. We've lost our moral compass. What do you think? Yeah, Jay, it's so right that you say, see now, uh, funding is going on, for example. Uh, funding is going on to Ukraine. Suppose the leadership changes and funding stops to Ukraine. Where do they go from here? It becomes so difficult for them to go ahead with anything. So, uh, like you said, the morality of humanity has lost its way. There's no set stand that whoever comes into power, we will continue to fight Russia or community of states will come together, form a coalition and protect Ukraine. Or we will condemn the uh, attack on uh, Israel in a univocal way. Why should there be two voices? Why should the word Hamas be missing from a UN resolution? It is so, uh, uh, what do you say, at the lowest level of politics, Jay. You can't, when you call a spade a spade, that is when you do right politics. When you try to uh, hide them in a deck of cards, that is that is wrong politics. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's the way <laughs> Well, thank you, Rupmati. This has been a really good and interesting and important discussion. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we'll see you next week. Aloha. Aloha, Jay. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.